Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I welcome uh, the Australia Post by video conference. Uh, we welcome the new group, Chief Executive Officer, Managing Director, Mr. Paul Graham. Uh, we will uh, waive our general prohibition on opening statements um, to allow you to make a, a, a very brief opening statement um, on the basis of it being your first Senate estimates. Uh, so we invite you now to go ahead with your opening statement, Mr. Graham, and then we'll invite questions from the Senators. Thank you, Chair and Senators. So my name is Paul Graham. I'm the Group Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Australia Post. It is a privilege to appear before the committee for the first time in this capacity, leading an organisation that connects our people within our shores and beyond. Australia Post is a loved national icon that I have long held a deep respect for, and as an organisation, it's more vital now than it has ever been. I've spent my whole career in large, complex organisations and service industries, from logistics and retail, agriculture and technology. The most common motivation across all these roles has been ensuring people are safe and feel connected and this will remain a key priority for me at Australia Post. Over the past 18 months, while we have faced more than our fair share of challenges, our people have worked harder than ever to keep Australia connected. In August, Australia Post released its full year 2021 results, announcing record group revenue of 8.27 billion, boosted by the continued growth in e-commerce brought about by COVID-19, with parcel and services revenue up 17.7%, to 6.48 billion, with Australia Post branded parcels volume up 27.1%. We announced a profit before tax of 100 million, despite disruptions to network operations, additional resources to support lockdowns, and significantly reduced transport capacity. The profit result was tempered once again by the continued decline in addressed letter volumes, which were down 11.6%, with letter revenue down 202 million. We all know that the pandemic has changed how we have lived, worked and even socialised, but has also permanently changed the Australian e-commerce landscape. August and September were some of the biggest months in our 211 year history. With some 15 million people in lockdown, online shopping surged. In August alone, e-commerce grew 24% year on year and over 5.7 million households bought something online, more than half of all Australians. At the moment, it feels like we're setting new records each month. Last December was our biggest month ever, Yet into September just gone, we were up 40% on that again. And each week we are consistently delivering well over 10 million parcels per week. Senators, this changing landscape presents us with both opportunities and challenges. We are on a journey to becoming a modern mail, e-commerce, digital services and retail business. Whilst our 450 million investment in the future has served us well, with the opening of new facilities in Sunshine West and Victoria, and last week the opening of a new parcel facility in Adelaide, we have further plans for facilities in Bayswater and Victoria, Western Sydney and Botany, New South Wales, and also have announced a new Perth parcel facility to come online next year. The lack of flights across both domestic and international routes has been an ongoing challenge for us through the course of the pandemic, but we have chartered additional freighters to help carry the record volumes coming through the network. A recent report from Deloitte found that two thirds of businesses say Australia Post has been vital in helping them survive COVID-19. That same survey found that Australia Post is more than a delivery service, it's a community service. We are not just delivering mail and parcels, but providing that friendly community interaction, including checking that elderly lady two doors down to make sure she's okay. Almost half of those surveyed strongly agree or agree that Australia Post helps them access essential services during natural disasters or the pandemic. And 54% of consumers believe that the post office contributed to community resilience. Through the most challenging of times, our people have been fantastic through it all, and we look towards Christmas, which we expect to be our busiest ever, we're adding a further 4,000 people to our teams across the country to sort and deliver mail and parcels and help customers with their queries. There's no doubt that border closures, restrictions, freight capacity and complying with necessary COVID safe measures have created significant challenges for our network. I want to take this opportunity to thank our customers and all Australians for their patience as we tackle these challenges. But our priority is keeping our people and customers safe, and we are complying with all government and local health directions as we have done throughout the pandemic. As restrictions reduce and domestic flights return, we are confident of further improvements to speed and reliability. Our post offices, which have remained open through the pandemic, continue to be more important than ever, acting as a vital local hub for Australians, particularly in rural and regional Australia. 
Our frontline teams and post offices across the country have helped communities stay connected to important services, including our bank at post offering. In closing, I would like to thank our incredible 64,000 strong team for their dedication, focus and commitment during a demanding period for the organisation. I am very proud to represent them today. Despite so much change, one constant has been the focus on the safety of our people, something that I will ensure continues to be our priority, not just the physical safety, but the mental health of our people too, who have worked powerlessly during a difficult time. From our posters and drivers to our post office team, including our fantastic licensee post offices and our support office team. They have kept businesses afloat and they have helped Australia get through this moment in history as they have done many times in the past. As I've begun to make my way around facilities, albeit only in New South Wales for now, I've been humbled by the pride that our people take in all that they do. They have kept Australia moving and helped us stay connected, something that should not be overlooked. I look forward to working with all stakeholders to help move Australia post forward and doing so in a sustainable way that contributes to invest in our network and further broadens our offering of essential services, particularly in regional communities where they are so okay. vitally important. Chair, the Australia Post team stands ready to take your questions. All right, thanks, Mr Graham. Chair, could I, could I ask Mr Graham to table his opening statement? Yeah, can we get a copy of your speech, please, Mr Graham, to be tabled? And, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. Could you, could you, um, you, do you have that electronically? And you can just send, you can email yeah. it through? So we can Correct. have it, so we can have it now. Okay. Yes, that's, we will email it through. That's happening. Thank you. Okay, Senator Sheldon. Good, thanks very much, Chair. Um, and Mr Graham, I, it's good to um, see you again. Look, I, um, Ms Davies, um, seeing as Mr Graham is new to the role, and again, I'd just like to congratulate you on your appointment, Mr. Uh, Graham. Um, I'll direct the next few questions to you. Uh, your annual report says Star Trek volumes increased 12.1% in the last year. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. So it's been a good year, would you describe it? It's been a, an unusual year, Senator. Um, so, it's, 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 sorry, did you see? Sorry to intercede. Um, uh, just because we have a lot of people on the video conferencing, it's looking a bit like the Brady Bunch here in a good way. Um, we do need people to state their names uh, for the handout record. So my apologies for the um, the, uh, the reminder on that, but it's very important that every time you speak, you do say who you are. Sorry. And, and Chair, just uh, just to clarify, I'm suggesting that uh, it has been a good year on the increase in income. Obviously, there's been other challenges. To you, uh, Ms Davies. So, just take a step back. Susan Davies, Executive General Manager of People and Culture. Um, yes, it's, it's been a challenging year. It's been an extremely busy year. Um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what you'd term as a, a good year, Senator, but uh, I think for everyone it's been extremely challenging. Good, thanks. I'll just go to another question, but I think 12.1% the last year means there has been a good year um, in income terms. Your overall remuneration increase, your overall remuneration increased from 794,000 to more than $1.5 million. That's an increase of 92%. Yep. Your base salary also jumped by about 12%. Does that sound right? No, that doesn't sound right, Senator. Um, that's, that's not correct. Um, the uh, Australia Post uh, executive last year, which it was widely communicated and reported the yes, Australia Post executive took a pay freeze uh, along with the uh, all Australia Post employees. And the executive actually took a uh, three month pay cut of 20% last year. Um, and we also uh, for, for, forgot well, the, the, uh, the bonus payments as well. So, so it's not true to, to say that any of the executive have, have had a, an increase. Certainly, if you're talking about my salary in particular, Senator, then no, no it hasn't. That's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Ms. Davies, hi, it's Kimberly Kitching. Could I just ask, but you did receive bonuses not in the, um, around the end start of the financial year, you received them a few months after that? 
No, we didn't, Senator. We didn't receive any STI payments last year at all. In the from an exact from an exact point of view. Yeah, in the nineteen twenty financial year. So in in nineteen twenty. So in yeah. twenty one, so, we as as is documented in the remuneration report and the board report. Um, yes. Uh, the, the incentives, the STIs, have been paid out this year. Okay, so sorry, they were paid in 2021. Yes. Rather than 1920. So you did receive bonuses or STI payments. We received STI yes. payments as reported in the annual report. Yes, for thank, yes, and I'm actually I've yeah. had a look at that chapter of the annual report. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So just just clarify um, over the last two years the bonuses you've received and was and your salary increase. I just want to be clear about that. What, what was your salary increase? Are you talking about mine personally? Yeah, Senator? I'm talking about yours, Ms. Davies. Yeah. So last year I did not receive a salary increase. Last December I did not receive a salary increase. Um, the year before. Um, I believe the exec received a, a two percent, but let me let me confirm that for you, Senator, for, for clarity. No, I'm asking about your increase um, from seven hundred ninety-four thousand to more than one point five million. Is that correct? A ninety-two percent increase? No, that's not correct, Senator. I'll, I'll state that again. That is that is not correct. Um, so, if you refer to the remuneration report. Um, it's uh, very transparent. We, re we report all our salaries. If it's mine in particular that you want to look at, um, then that's reported in, in, in the REM report this year and last year. Um, and the uh, stretch um, part of, of, of my salary, I have a base salary and I have um, um, a, a short-term incentive component to uh, my salary and that is not increase whether that whether that was achieved or paid um, is is a different question. But my salary has not oh. been increased. Did you do? Did you achieve your stretch? Yes. And what was that? So it, okay, all of this was reported in in the REN. So if you look at the uh, the numbers that have just been reported. Um, then there's a base we, uh, as, as an exec member, um, there is a 70% um, a um, payment of STI um, on target and a 30% on stretch. There is a very detailed scorecard, um, very transparent, and there's a lot of governance around that scorecard and there's a lot of governance around the uh, Australian Post remuneration policies. Um, and so scorecards are set individually. I have my scorecard. Um, a, 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 a bulk of the scorecard is on uh, enterprise financials, 50%. Um, that's 25% on revenue and 25% on PBT. Um, and then we've got core um, objectives within that scorecard of consumer NPS, business NPS, service levels, DIFOP, uh, employee index. And of course, importantly, safety. So, just, just taking into account the, um, your overall package, um, what um, what was the bonus? I'm just not quite clear about the actual figure, Ms. Davies, that your bonus um, constituted how much money? So, my short term incentive is at a hundred percent. So, if my if you look back on on last year, if my salary was at seven five seven, then my um, potential um, to to earn is is at 100% um, at stretch. So 70% at target, 30% at stretch. So when Senator Sheldon said, I think the figure he quoted was a 90% um, doubling on on the baseline, and you said no. In 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 fact, according to your contract, you did achieve those milestones, and he was correct. Well, no, the question was, did I get an increase in my salary? No, I didn't get an increase in my salary. Last year, we were not paid um, STIs. This year, we were paid STIs. So it's not an increase. It's just that we actually paid the STIs this year. We didn't last year. 
I'm not, I'm not asking you, but I'll just, just then go to your overall remuneration increase from 794000 to more than $1.5 You said that's incorrect. What is the correct amount of, in dollar terms? Actual dollar, hard, cold cash. So on my base salary, there was no increase. But if you're talking about... You're talking about your remuneration, no. uh, Ms Davies. So well, your, your package, it's, it's, your package. It's clear. So I think it's clear in the uh, REM report, and, and I think I've stated what my, my package is, and that's a, a, a base salary with a short-term incentive at up to 100%, 70% at target, 30% at stretch. And the question was, have I had an increase from last year to this year? No, not on the, on the actual salary. Did, we achieve, did, did I receive a payment this year that I didn't receive last year? Yes. So if, if my full earning potential, um, what I achieved this year, then, then yes is the question. I'm not trying to be difficult, Senator. I'm just trying to answer the uh, question correctly. Senator, if I could um, clarify, you know, in simple terms, you're, you're, the, the number you quote is correct. Uh, as Ms Davies uh, said, uh, she has a base salary that has not increased. Uh, based on a target and then a stretch performance that is uh, exceeding obviously that target amount, then she would have got 100% of her base, which equates to the figure that you mentioned. Uh, the subject of remuneration is an important issue and is getting some attention, and there are a few points that I would like to make. Australia Post is delivering a vital service today in the face of enormous challenges. Uh, my commitment is to ensure we have the right workplace models to deliver this sustainably. Not Mr. Mr. Grime, can I interrupt you for a second? Certainly. No, I'm not asking you a question about that. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, uh, Chair. Um, okay. I was directing directly a question to Ms Davies. I'm uh, still trying to uh, get a, a figure out of Ms Davies regarding um, the amount, okay. the actual just financial amount of net increase uh, over uh, the last... It's 100%. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just... Sorry, just to intercede. So, um, I think... Um, Mr. Graham, if you have some brief, a brief statement to make about this, uh, and then yes. and then Senator Sheldon is correct um, that he can pursue his line um, and pursue an answer. But I think Mr. Graham, um, if you have something to add briefly, I think you should be entitled to do that. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so, as I said, you know, our, my purpose is to ensure that the workplace models deliver this are sustainable without being a burden to the taxpayer. Uh, I'm conscious that every dollar we spend is a dollar that belongs to the people of Australia and I intend to use it wisely. The framework for remuneration is determined by the board. It's clearly set out in an annual report. It's externally accountable, simple and transparent, fair, equitable and motivational, strategically aligned and performance linked, shared responsibly and personal accountability and there's a clear remuneration governance. But in direct response to Senator Sheldon's question, uh, Ms Davies had 100% of her base salary rewarded as a short-term incentive based on achieving a stretch target for the group's results. And and so what, what's that? Can you just do the maths for me? What's the total? 1.52 million, 1.4. I can actually look it up specifically in the annual report. Uh, but it's 754 times, 794 times 2. So 1.48, 1.5 million, Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. We need to um, rotate the call. We'll come, come back to you. Okay, um, Senator Small. Thanks, Here's Chair, um, and good morning, folks. I'll just address my questions broadly, and whoever's best place can can answer them. And um, I wanted to ask about what impact uh, the first strike by the TWU had on the Australia Post business. Thank you, Senator Small. I will uh, refer that comment to uh, Rod Barnes, who's our head of uh, our national network and operations. Uh, and directly involved in obviously providing that service to our customers. So, uh, Rod. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Senators. Rod Barnes, Executive General Manager of Deliveries for Australia Post. At the first uh, period of industrial action that we had uh, some weeks ago, I think uh, approximately five to 600 staff participated, chose to participate in that action that day. We did have some delays. Uh, we recovered all of those delays within two business days, and Victoria was probably our most challenged. Uh, we did suffer some impact to uh, some critical shipments we weren't, weren't able to, uh, to isolate um, and a uh, pretty challenging period, but we got through that after about three business days, Senator. Thanks, Mr Barnes. Can you outline exactly what you mean by uh, that sort of business impact? How many parcels were delayed? Um, and when you said critical shipments, what were you referring to? 
Uh, medical shipments, uh, Senator, and foodstuffs. So items that uh, traditionally consigned by business, such as pharmaceuticals, uh, medicines, and items for hospitals and so forth. The uh, the items in question delayed, uh, and I'll take the exact note, uh, number on notice, Senator. It was about seventy four thousand parcels in Victoria, and approximately thirteen thousand parcels in New South Wales for that day. So, does that mean that? Um Union guarantees to exempt medical deliveries and other critical uh, deliveries uh, from the industrial action uh, were not, in fact, uh, able to be delivered? Um, Senator, the union did make some commitments during the industrial discussion, shall I say, around protecting and working with us to try and isolate those shipments. That's particularly difficult when you have trailers, uh, many trailers coming through with up to two to 3,000 individual articles in those trailers. So unless we're able to actually identify the shipment being medical, which isn't always done, it becomes quite hard to do that. Uh, we did argue that we would like to have had those trailers all processed, and if that had been the case, we could have been in a place to identify the receivers and hospitals and move that product. In some cases, we were able to do that. We were pre-positioned, we'd be able to, with the time we had, pre-communicate with customers. But once that's not the case, it makes it very difficult for us to identify those shipments amongst that sheer volume. So just to be very, very clear, medical shipments were delayed by the industrial action? Yes. Thank you. When we, uh, when we come to the second round of industrial action by the TWU, what business impacts did that have? Um, it's a little bit reduced, Senator. We only saw in our Star Trek premium business, for example, we saw less than 20 staff take action across our Star Trek Express business. It was about 450, but I can get the exact numbers on notice, Senator. Again, Victoria was probably our most challenged area. This particular time, the business caught up in the day. We did suffer, again, delays to those, some of those shipments, but all businesses. Um, and as I say, with the Saturday and the weekend recovery and using the Australia Post network, uh, we were able to mitigate some of those challenges. And that is impressive mitigation, Mr Barnes, but if the TWU continue with industrial action, do you foresee an impact on Christmas deliveries? Um, and I guess specifically impacts on retail small business customers and the like who are relying on your services to be able to fulfil uh, both deliveries to customers and stock um, which they need to trade and employ people. Absolutely, Senator. We've made uh, significant progress in the last year by allowing our products across the Australia Post business and the Star Trek business to be managed on all machines. So Star Trek now fulfil even a greater role in assisting not only the Star Trek business, but the Australia Post business and also reciprocally. So any industrial action from Star Trek will impact the Australia Post business. I guess uh, a final question on the back of that. I understand that some 30,000 Australia Post staff have accepted identical EBAs, uh, each with a 3% pay rise each year over the three year life of the agreement. So can you offer a view as to why the TWU won't accept that same agreement applying to the approximately 3,000 Star Trek staff that's good enough for 30,000 Australia Post staff? Uh, it's difficult for me to, to make a statement on what the TWU feel on that offer. Um, it is also difficult for me to understand the nature of claim. We've gone from claims of pay to super to job security and now we seem to be back to pay again. Uh, I've not been personally involved in all of those Star Trek negotiations. I was involved with the Australia Post. Uh, Ms Davies may be to add further detail in relation to that question, uh, Senator, on the, on the EBA outcomes. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, uh, Rod, and I'm delighted to say that we, we worked extremely hard um, with, with the, uh, the CPU to reach an agreement with uh, the Australia Post EBA, which covers 31,000 um, of our employees, as you say, Senator. And that's a three-year agreement with a three, three and three percent um, and 12 percent super and a range of commitments um, around security um, and, and employment ongoing. I guess one of the more important parts of, of that EBA negotiations was really to reach um, a, a, a term of reference agreement with the CPU on working uh, forward on, on the rollback of the, um, um, the, the uh, three-day delivery 
um, the change of reg relief into rolling forward back to a five-day delivery, but really importantly, working with the, uh, the union and our employees over the next three years to come to a sustainable delivery model for Australia Post that delivers for our customers and the community um, and keeps Australia Post sustainable. Thanks for your, uh, your honesty, folks, and I think you're being very polite by calling that a uh, negotiation. It certainly sounds like something a little more thuggish. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Small. Uh, we will uh, go back to Senator Sheldon for the next rotation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to clarify something, uh, Australia Post went to the Fair Work Commission in an attempt to prevent your uh, workers being, uh, from taking protected industrial action on the basis it would disrupt medical deliveries, including COVID-19 vaccines. Australia Post lost that case, and Commissioner Cambridge said, and I quote, on any realistic and objective assessment, the level of, level of any such threat would be accurately described as being of very low order. Mm. Um, that's a pretty clear verdict, isn't it? Well, Senator, I think, you know, uh, if you look at uh, any loss uh, of delivery of a uh, uh, pharmaceutical or a product that is important for someone's health. Uh, surely one delivery missed is important to that individual. Uh, we uh, attempted to uh, prevent any disruption uh, to our network, not only to ensure that urgent medical and pharmaceutical and healthcare items were delivered, but also we are and were in the middle of uh, a pandemic, a lockdown of the two most populous states in the country. And as a network, any disruption has a significant roll-on effect across our network. Uh, so we were ensuring that we looked after our customers and kept our people safe. And we respect uh, the judgment as it was given uh, and continue to negotiate uh, with the TW in relation to uh, trying to reach uh, an agreement that we can all uh, accept is good for our team members, uh, good for our customers, and good for the sustainability of the business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. I just, just um, want to then just, just say this: in very, um, if it's a very low order of threat, um, there were suggestions made that there was a substantial disruption, and um, I just want to draw to your attention that Commission's decision that it was only very low. Now, thanks. Um, so I understand, you know, from the evidence given now this morning that. Um, figure of $1.5 million for overall remuneration uh, package um, is correct, and I, uh, the actual payment made. Um, I want to turn now to your workers. Is it correct, and this is uh, to Ms Davies again, is it correct that Star Trek workers employed under your National Enterprise Agreement have not received a pay increase since December 2019, whilst you're on $1.5 million? It's correct that the Australia, the whole Australia Post group, um, of which Star Trek is a, a wholly owned subsidiary, um, took a, a, a freeze in pay last year. Um, Star Trek nationally um, didn't take that, that full pay freeze for the whole year. Um, and New South Wales, um, an even small, uh, smaller um, pay freeze. But it is, it is true to say that we, uh, we all in the uh, during the the, the, the year that, that was last year in COVID, um, took a, a pay freeze across the organisation. So your statement is correct, Senator. Thank you. So it's essentially um, for the bulk. It's for essentially the workforce. It's um, for the last two years. Uh, Star Trek workers under your national EBA received um, that there has been no increase um, received um, pay increase except in the terms that you just described for some isolated groups. So the vast bulk of the workforce has not received it. But at the same time, there's been massive bonuses paid. I mean, this comes to a critical, critical issue: massive bonuses, remuneration packages, and a comparison with what's been paid to Star Trek employees. Have, uh, is your intention to pay those Star Trek employees from the period um, of last year when there was substantial and from the expiry date of the agreement? Well, as you're aware, Senator, that is part of the ongoing EBA negotiation with the TWU, which we are still working through and bargaining in good faith, and that's something that we're working through. 
So at this point, you can't tell me that those workers that deferred wage increases um, in, because of all the general public concern, um, including the workforce, about what the effect of COVID pandemic would be. As it turned out, in the last year, it's been a 12.1% increase in volumes. Substantial bonuses have been paid, and yet these workers still have not received a pay increase offer from that period. Is that correct? Um, I will point out, Senator Sheldon, that we made an offer in July. We have made the same offer to the Transport Workers Union and to uh, our Star Trek employees as we've made to the other 31,000 employees in Australia Post, and that is a three-year agreement with a 3% increase for each of those years, um, maintaining the super at 12%. Um, and some significant movement around uh, commitments in the form of um, uh, outside hire and, and agency labour with regards to uh, job security, which, as you know, is, is obviously the uh, key drive in the EBA negotiation. Thank you, Ms Davies. Ms Davies, could you confirm that the previous annual pay increases in EBA prior to this freeze was 2% per annum? It was 2% per annum with a 1% um, um, incentive linked to uh, performance. And that, but last, and that... year, last year in the, in, in the pay freeze, we did actually pay all of our, our workforce um, in, in EBA, so the 31,000 plus the Star Trek employees, um, plus our contractors and our licensees, we paid a 1% thank you payment um, to, to everyone for their, uh, their hard work that they put into uh, last year with COVID. But the average... But yes, that's correct. It, it was 2% plus a 1% incentive. And the... Thank you. So the average increase has been 2% and there's been some isolated low volume bonuses that have been paid, not 100% um, bonus paid to them, was it? As was paid to you? Well, your remuneration went to 1.5 million. That's, you know, that's almost, you know, that's at least double. You know, it's a... um, I'm not sure where that question is, is going, Senator. Clearly, uh, someone in, within uh, an award, on award or within an EBA is paid on a very different um, structure to someone on, on a contract. Um, uh, right, so executives can get bonuses which double, almost double their, or do double their income to 1.5 million, and workers receive, uh, don't, haven't received uh, anything beyond 1% uh, uh, bonus payment. It seems, well, in, it seems, it seems inappropriate um, to me. Does your bonus increase the more you hold wages back inside the organisation? No, it doesn't, Senator. So I just want to be, uh, uh, I just want to, sorry, yes. Okay. So, um, are you proceeding with your yeah, line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Star Trek workers have uh, had a pay freeze in 2021, a pay freeze in 2020, and before that, an annual pay rise of 2%, which would barely cover inflation. And in that same time, your business has grown substantially, both in volume and in profit. Is there a, there's a serious question of equity here between what's paid, as you say, to award employees, because they're award employees, and what's paid to executives, isn't there? I think, uh, Senator, it, you know, we have to also take into account uh, the situation in relation to the fact that we have an industry-leading award uh, and pay agreement on the table today. Uh, our Star Trek team members uh, are paid uh, at the higher end of uh, the award scale. Uh, in terms of the EA, EBA that we have negotiated. Uh, it is, uh, like any organisation, uh, a situation where you have uh, team members on award uh, rates and award agreements, and you have executives on contracts uh, that have a high proportion of the uh, package, in this case, uh, 100%, uh, or that is at risk. Uh, we compete in a, in a very dynamic international marketplace and domestic marketplace. 80% of our revenue today is in a market where we have significant competition and we have to ensure that we maintain a competitive remuneration package that is established by the board 
to, to enable us to attract and retain talent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gray. And the TW has recently um, been bargaining with eight major road transport companies, including StarTrack. Um, Ms. Davies, do you know how many of those eight companies have reached an agreement? I, I understand from the, uh, the, the media coverage that um, all have reached an in-principle agreement with the exception of Star Trek and FedEx. So Star Trek is only of two organisations holding out. Is it correct that the TW has been attempting to bargain with Star Trek since October 2020, more than a year ago? Well, that's, that's not 100% correct, Senator. We, uh, entered into discussions with the TW in October to talk about um, a, 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 an MOU, um, entering into an MOU as we did with our other um, union, the CPU, that covers 31,000 people. We wanted to do the same um, with the TW, but unfortunately we could not agree on the terms of that MOU. Um, and so we, we commenced bargaining in April of this year. And Senator, I think it's also important to note that the payoff we have in the table of 3% over three years is a higher rate of pay being offered than those six agreements that have already been concluded by the TW. Okay. Um, I need to break up the call so we can come back to you. Yep. Uh, I believe, Senator Antic, you have some questions. Yeah, thank you, Chair, I do. I'd just like to turn to a couple of operational uh, matters, if I could. Um, Australia Post has a um, system of, of postmarking letters. I think it's a system that um, records when and where the letters are sent, at dates and times, that sort of thing you often see at the top of the letter. It's come to my attention that um, letters going out at the moment are using the phrase be safe and vaccinate, great big thumbs up. The question I've got is um, why is Australia Post giving Australians medical advice? That's a good question, uh, Senator, and uh, I may uh, refer that to, uh, to Nick uh, McDonald, who's our head legal counsel. Uh, we do encourage uh, people uh, across uh, our business and using the mediums that we have uh, in many things, whether it be mental health and well-being, whether it be celebration of things like uh, our Indigenous past. Uh, but I will refer that uh, question to Nick McDonald, our head legal counsel. Nick? Uh. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Nick McDonald. I'm General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Australia Post. Uh, so thank you for your question, Senator. I am aware of that postmark, and it is certainly not something that constitutes medical advice on the part of Australia Post. Uh, what it does is it encourages uh, people to consider vaccination in a way that we consider is consistent with public health messaging uh, and messages from other organisations. Well, you, I mean, I'm sorry to be glib about this, but you, you say it's not medical advice, but you're telling people to go and vaccinate. How, how could it be anything other than medical advice? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I don't agree that we're telling people to get vaccinated. Uh, what we're doing is uh, promoting vaccination as uh, a means of uh, responding to uh, the COVID pandemic uh, that we're all facing and as an organisation, as are many other organisations, uh, we took the view that it's appropriate to encourage our, our team members uh, and our extended uh, workforce as well as um, our customers to consider vaccination. Uh, but I, I don't agree that it's medical advice. You don't agree that telling people to take a medical procedure is medical advice? Who, who, who makes the decision uh, to do this and is it, is it part of a policy position or platform uh, that Australia Post has. Uh, so my recollection is that decision was one that was discussed uh, by the executive team uh, and it is not part of a particular platform or program, Senator. Yeah. And does Australia Post give out any other medical advice? Do you, do you tell people to go and take blood tests or have endoscopies or angiograms or any other invasive medical procedures? Uh, as I said, Senator, uh, we, we don't consider that particular postmark to be medical advice, but uh, the organisation's not in the practice of giving medical advice, Senator. So it's just this one off? Well, as I've said, I, I don't consider it medical advice. Hmm. Do you think it's appropriate advice or do you think that's a matter between the person and their general practitioner? Uh, the decision about whether to get vaccinated is a personal one, uh, but 
I nevertheless think it's appropriate uh, for us as an organisation to encourage people to consider vaccination and, and that, and that uh, is the intent of that postmark. And will Australia Post um, mandate vaccinations for its employees and will it have any other vaccine mandate policies that it spreads out throughout its operations, its centres, its post offices? Uh, thank you, Senator. Like many other organisations, uh, we're considering uh, matters of policy around vaccination uh, in our uh, across our team members uh, and uh, we've got an extended workforce uh, as others have mentioned in terms of contractors and licensees so those are matters of live consideration for us as an organisation as they are for other organisations. Uh, we're also subject to various state and territory based requirements and restrictions and obviously we, we work uh, within those as we're required to do so. Thank you. Okay. That's all for me, Chair. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Um, I might just because you have five minutes remaining. Do you want to take yeah, like the balance? Long, if that's with your indulgence, Chair. Yeah, all good. Th thank you very much, Chair. Uh, look, I just have some questions on. I believe Australia Post has made some arrangements with Seven Eleven recently. Is there anyone, any official that could help me out with that? Uh, yes, uh, Sandra. I'll uh, pass you across to uh, David McNamara, who looks after our post, post office network and has been directly involved with that 7-Eleven uh, 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 contract. Dave? Yeah. Well, I'll just, yeah, I'll just am after a brief description first, what exactly that is. So, yep, yep, over oh, here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, David McNamara, General Manager of the Post Office Network. So, Senator, we have an arrangement with 7-Eleven uh, to use their 7-Eleven lockers. Uh, those lockers are whereby our customers who use our MyPost account have the ability to use that location to actually have their items delivered to. So those articles are delivered by Australia Post personnel, whether it's our contractors, whether it's our postie, or whether it's our post office staff into the lock. Um, that locker then sends the information to the customer. The customer then gets the same information they would get from a red locker, which is the Australia Post locker and the 7-Eleven, um, and they come and pick up that item. Uh, if the item's not collected, our Australia Post staff will actually then take the item out of the uh, locker um, and then it will go back to the local post office whereby it's collected. So no different to how we operate our current um, process. Uh, all we're using is the infrastructure at 7-Eleven to provide more coverage for Australians to pick up articles from, from those locations. Will this have an impact on the business or revenues of uh, licensed post offices and have you assessed that impact? Uh, so, Senator, yes, we, we've assessed that. We offer for our licensees uh, the ability to load those lockers like we do with our red lockers. So, no different to how we actually undertake the current locker process, whereby the licensee has the ability to load and unload those lockers. So, we're operating it in the same mechanism we do for our entire parcel locker fleet. So, you don't expect any reduced revenue at all or any substitution away from the licensed post office that would reduce their revenues as a result of this contract? Uh, so, because it's a parcel collect and it's an addressed item, uh, no. So, basically, there is another uh, area where LPOs receive remuneration from carded items. This is around where customers are actually selecting an address to get their item, which is different to other revenues received from LPOs. So, there, there may be, or there, there, I mean, I'm only asking if there may be a, an impact on LPO revenues as a result of this decision. Will it depend on customer behaviours and responses? It would depend, yes, Senator, it would depend on customer behaviours, but what we see is it tends to actually increase the volume that goes to those areas. Fair enough. Ken, you've obviously made an arrangement with a third party here and it seems to make some sense to provide that flexibility uh, to Australians. Can licensed post offices make arrangements with third party postal delivery services like Toll uh, or Amazon or other um, uh, companies to pa handle their packaging, especially in rural or remote or regional towns where toll or others might not have their own footprint? Uh, so the arrangements we have for, for toll or for others is around for our PO boxes. We have PO Box Plus where uh, toll can actually, if a customer is paying for that, can actually provide that into a PO Box. But from a provision of having toll go directly into a post office, no, it's it's out, it's outside because obviously the parcel service is a core element and under our agreement, um, we don't allow competitors into um, our network, whether it's corporates or LPOs. But this is sort of my point here. It seems an unbalanced agreement that you, as the licensor, 
can make arrangements with third parties that will potentially reduce revenue streams for your licensees, but the licensees don't have the same flexibility. Uh, Senator, we actually, in, as I said in my previous answer was, we do allow our licensees, as we always do, um, to, to be the first uh, point of actually offering those services for our parcel lockers. Um, we see just the infrastructure at 7-Eleven is just the expansion of our red locker network, the same as it would be for Woolworths. So there's no difference in how we do it. We always offer our licensees that option um, if it's in their locality. Just, um, I'll, I'll move on and th this one hopefully won't take too long. Just can you give an update on the bank at post negotiations, especially where you are with, I think, Westpac and ANZ? Uh, have you finalised? It might be a different person, sorry, but has anyone ever finalised um, agreements with uh, Westpac and ANZ? Senator, I'll uh, refer you to uh, Gary Starr, who's uh, head of uh, commercial and in, is directly involved in those negotiations. Gary? Uh, thank you, Senator. Gary Starr, Executive General Manager, Business Government and, and um, International. So um, we have signed uh, uh, letters of intent and working through agreements with the National Australia Bank and the Commonwealth Bank, as we previously communicated for 10 years. Uh, Westpac remains committed to the Bank at Post service um, and has an existing contract with us to the end of 2022. And we're working with them on longer term commitment which includes discussions about future services for their customers. Um, they made a, they executed on a one-year extension that was built into the original contract and was all, always an available option. And we're speaking regularly with the Westpac team and expect to um, extend that arrangement in due course. And with ANZ Bank, yes, we have had discussions with ANZ and we've agreed to ongoing discussions but haven't reached any agreement at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. Ben. Um, I just, we've got post for another 12 minutes. I'm just trying to see whether or not we're going to need to. Okay. Well, I'm just getting a sense of whether there's any other. Okay, and so just, we'll, we'll just, hand I mean, it to. This is a forum really for the opposition. Yeah, so yeah. it would be well, good. good too. Yeah. No, no problem. I'm just trying to get a sense of timing. So, um, have you expired your line? We're coming no, back to you, Senator Shaw. Okay. Questions, well, why yeah. don't we we'll hand the call to Labor senators, and you can work through your questions. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, now, we just received evidence about the massive footprint Star Trek has through yes. Post. Is it true that dragging out delays and a new agreement produces a financial benefit for Star Trek? Because it means you've managed to go another year without any pay increase. Ms Davies. Sorry, Senator, can you repeat that question? Is it true that we've got six out of eight companies which have said to us um, have reached agreement? Is it true that dragging out and delaying a new agreement produces a financial benefit oh, for yeah. Star Trek because it means you've managed to go another year without any pay increases? Well, that's certainly not been the intention um, of, of this agreement and as, as, as I said previously we started this negotiation in April um, and we put a pay offer on the table in July um, it's, it's absolutely the point that the longer this continues then um, employees do not, not get their pay increase and we are extremely keen that employees do get the pay increase the Australia Post, the other 31,000 employees got their pay increase the first pay period in September. So we're extremely keen that, that that's passed on to uh, our Star Trek employees. So you're, you're saying that you're, pass, you're offering the same percentage that was paid to Australia Post, is that what you're saying, in the same timelines? Just want to be clear. I'm saying, I'm saying that we put an offer in July, we put an offer on the table of 3% of over a three year period. Um, to our Star Trek employees, and, Star and we're currently working through. We're currently working through, as as you know, Senator. We're currently working through the negotiation. Still negotiating in 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 good faith and trying very hard to get this to a conclusion. Ms. Davies, can can you understand my um, just concern that we've got six out of eight companies that have reached agreement? Um, Australia Post and Star Trek through its Australian Post operations is making um, substantial amounts of money and has a dominant position in parts of the market. Um, can you, can you, you're still not saying to me, is there a 
offer made for the two year for that many of those workers have um, suffered a wage freeze, even though bonuses have been paid, in your case, you know, double the income, um, and um, we've had a two year wage freeze, I mean, and a 12 point, over 12% 12 uh, increase in volumes. You know, is that, do you describe that as fair? Senator, uh, I think, as I've said before, the current conditions under which uh, Star Trek are paid are industry leading. Uh, so we certainly uh, are, are very uh, much focused on ensuring that we put uh, the additional uh, uh, salary in their back pockets. That's what we want to do. Uh, there is no intention or no interest in us saving money. We want to spend that money by investing in our people. The offer that we have made is above uh, from a pay scale, uh, the six agreements that are already been concluded, uh, which I believe were a variance between 2.5 and 2.75%. Our offer is 3% a year for three years, uh, and therefore we feel it is a more generous offer than those that have already been concluded. I would like to see this uh, EBA concluded as quickly as possible because we want to ensure that our people have that additional money in their pocket uh, to uh, uh, reward them for uh, the work that they have done both uh, during this pandemic but as well as uh, in the past. Yeah, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, Mr. Davies, it's been two years since Star Trek workers saw a pay rise. Given the lengthy delays, the reasonable the wage claim in the new agreement is backdated to the expiry of the previous agreement in December 2020. So, as I said, Senator, that is a, a point that is currently being negotiated in the EBA and we're continuing to negotiate in good faith and probably um, not, not a, appropriate for, for that negotiation to, uh, to, to carry out in, in the Senate. Um, we are meeting with the TWU again um, and, and we're hoping to bring this to a conclusion. There are a number of things that we have put back to the TWU um, as, as Paul says, we, we've actually um, positioned the highest uh, wage offer in these six organisations. Um, we've, we've put some considerable um, assurances around job security, which is what the, uh, the, the, the TW um, have positioned extremely strongly from, from day one. Um, so, as I say, that, that's part of our negotiation and we continue to bargain in good faith. Thank you, Ms Davies. In, in 2020, uh, when you were budgeting for the 2021 financial year, did you budget for a situation where your workforce at Star Trek would not be receiving a pay increase over that year? Or were you budgeting for a pay rise? Um, May I refer that the Rodney Boys, our Chief Financial Officer, Senator Sheldon, I would expect that given that we had an EBA uh, in negotiation, we would have allowed in the budget uh, an allowance for an increase, but I'll specifically ask Rodney to confirm that it was considered in the, in the budget for this financial year. Thank you, Paul. Rodney Boys, Chief Financial Officer, Australia Post. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, so in the FY22 budget, we have allowed uh, for the increase uh, across Star Trek and Australia Post. And as Ms Davies says, we've concluded the agreement with the Australia Post employees and they have been paid and we're very pleased that we've uh, commenced the payment of those uh, from uh, the first pay period in September in line with budget. And we look forward to being able to pay our, uh, our, our Star Trek uh, employees uh, as soon as this agreement can be concluded. So th there's been, so it's been budgeted, um, but hasn't been paid. Um, I just want to. Oh, it hasn't been agreed. Sorry, the the pay, the uh, the employees have been paid, and we look forward to being able to pay them uh, at the conclusion of this agreement, uh, uh, in line with the agreement um, when it's when it's reached. So the sooner the better for for the employees, and for us. And of course, the sticking point is about the money that's been budgeted that hasn't been offered to the employees for that period at Star Trek. So I just want to just go to another question. Um, uh, Minister, um, Minister Fletcher described um, Star Trek workers, as I quote, the worst kind of old style union thuggery. Is there anything that's been said this morning that um, intimates to you that that's, there's thuggery has gone on? Australia Post, who would deliver, who were 
subject to the behaviour of the TWU. Well, it's a comment from uh, Minister Fletcher. It's not a comment from Star Trek. I, all I can do is reiterate the fact that Minister Fletcher did, indeed, did indeed say that. Right, so he's inferring violence. Um, can no, I just ask that's Star not Trek? Was doing. there any thuggery infers violence? Um, can I just ask Star Trek? Was there any violence involved in any of the disputes so far, or foreseeable? Senator Sheldon, not to our knowledge. Thank you. Um, just using the general language of thuggery, has there been any thuggery? Well, Senator, I think you know that's a, a word that has many meanings to it. Uh, you know, our discussions with uh, the TWU uh, are robust, uh, and they are certainly done on a professional basis. Uh, but they are uh, robust, uh, as one would expect. Uh, whether they uh, have any other description, I think, is up to. Uh, other individuals to ascertain. Not being directly involved in them day to day, uh, it's difficult to uh, ascertain that, but uh, my experience tells me that they're usually quite robust. I think we can safely say, though, Senator Sheldon, that whatever your definition of thuggery, the Australian population would see uh, taking industrial action in the middle of a pandemic is responsible to uh, say the least. Millions of Australians are relying on Star Trek to do their shopping online, to have their vaccines delivered and their vital supplies. And so that is, I think, a definition of thuggery. So, Senator Hume, um, in light of your statement you just made, um, you're saying that um, this is all on the backs of the Star Trek workforce, owner drivers, thousands of workers that have, that have accepted a wage freeze because of concerns about what might happen in the pandemic. Substantial increases have been paid as bonuses uh, to executives. Uh, we've seen um, an increase in well over 12 per cent of um, uh, increase in volumes. And you're saying to me that, um, that this somehow is an you know, inappropriate claim and you're, and you're describing people taking industrial action as a thuggery. So industrial action to your, in your mind is thuggery, is it? When the entire country is relying on their services, I think that there is a level of significant irresponsibility in industrial action. As Australia Post have outlined today, Star Trek employees are being offered a 3% pay rise per annum each year for the next three years and superannuation of 12%. The same offer has been accepted by nearly 30,000 other Australia Post staff represented by the CEPU and the CSU, and the onus is on the TWU to explain why a deal good enough for nearly 30,000 staff represented by other unions isn't good enough for Star Trek workers. Okay, we have you to take a break. I've just got one follow-up question, if that's okay. Okay, so we'll go to this last. Um, just the uh, last year, um, there was not uh, payments made, uh, Minister, um, and there was a wage freeze. So you're saying that those workers not being paid for that period is appropriate? I think now it's up to the TWU to, do the que to answer the questions, as opposed to Australia Post well, or indeed the government, because that sounds to me like a good deal. Well, Minister, it takes, you know, the old saying takes two to tango, doesn't it? Well, it takes an entire organisation, an entire union and a workforce to tango, clearly. And you recognise the fact that six out of eight companies uh, have reached agreement? 30,000 other Australia Post staff has reached, have reached an agreement, yes. Six out of eight, you are aware that six out of eight other companies have reached agreement? Evidence was given to that effect this morning? Well, my understanding is that now the ball is in the TWU's court. Okay, it's now 11 o'clock, so um, we are going to break. Uh, we're going to uh, need Australia Post to stay with us because I think Senator Kitching has a line of questioning, so we'll break for 15 minutes. Thank you.
Committee. Yeah. Okay, the committee will resume from the uh, tea break and Senator Kitching, you have the call. I'm actually the chair just going to go to Senator Sheldon just because Senator he's got Sheldon, a few you extra questions. Good. Thank go you ahead. very much, Chair. Um, it's to you, uh, Minister. Um, I've had an opportunity to look at the definition of thuggery in the Oxford Dictionary. It's, it says, violent behaviour, especially of a criminal nature. Minister, can you explain what violent behaviour is taking place at Star Trek? Senator Sheldon, thank you for that question. But I think, as Mr Graham said, the word thuggery can be interpreted in many different ways. I'm positive that uh, Minister Fletcher didn't check the Oxford English Dictionary Agreement a, a, a definition when he made his comments. But I think I can reiterate that he stands by his comments that those actions taken by the TWU and Star Trek workers was in fact irresponsible. It's a, it's a very That's serious. Not. It's a very serious accusation to make um, that people have engaged in thuggery, and quite clearly the community uh, view of thuggery is um, very close to the definition of the Oxford Dictionary, and that is that there's violence in so, involved or standover tactics. There's been no evidence to that effect. Now, is it? This is a very serious uh, accusation. Do you have any evidence? of violent behaviour, or are you just going to retract your accusation? I am not going to retract Senator, uh, Minister Fletcher's um, statement. In fact, he stands by that statement. And what I can say is that I do feel that holding an entire nation to ransom during a pandemic at a time when they relied on those Star Trek workers is, in fact, an act of thuggery. So, uh, a legally protected industrial action where there's two parties that are not reaching agreement. And I, and I'd so, and Star Trek, you know, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, a company that's had a broadly a history of um, good working relationships, um, when there's been hard disagreements, they've come to conclusions and got on with the job. No, no, no more so than during this pandemic. So it's completely irresponsible, just another example, the Morrison's government, total disdain for unions, and the workers they represent, plus exercising their legal industrial action. Well, you may say that, Senator Sheldon, but I think what it is in fact is the Morrison government standing up for all Australians who rely on the work that Australia Post has done, who rely on the work that Star Trek employees are doing to deliver their uh, parcels, to deliver their vaccines. And at a time when the, world, when the world is suffering from a pandemic, when Australia is relying on those employees to hold this organisation and to hold the public to ransom over a pay deal which 30,000 other Australia Post staff represented by the CPU and the CSU have agreed to is in fact irresponsible. Well, I certainly wouldn't be describing, uh, and I'd, I'd find it very difficult to say that um, anyone would appreciate your comments regarding thuggery when you're saying to uh, middle Australia that are fighting for middle Australia wages that they're carrying out thuggery by pursuing a fair arrangement with their employer. Um, legal arrangement, um, it's quite clear that it's deeply concerning. I, I just also just make this observation, and you may want to make a comment. Um, if those, those workers, a number of those are owner-operators, um, they run their own small business, um, they're under bargaining agreements um, with the TWU. Um, there's also, of course, a number of employees, you know, people that you'd find in any neighbourhood, um, well, any, any neighbourhood that I attend um, around um, Australia, very middle class. They've got, um, if they get their um, partners, wives, kids, grandparents have been called thugs. Do you think the rest of their family would be concerned about all their community? Senator Sheldon, I could point out to you that that is a very well-spoken argument for the Secretary of the TWU, which of course is a position that you have held. But as a, a, senator, a senator for New South Wales, your responsibility extends beyond simply those workers to all the people of New South Wales who are relying on the Star Trek employees to accept the offer that is in fact industry leading. And in fact, it's for three years, whereas everyone else is for two years. And as I reiterated before we went to the break, the ball is now firmly in the TWU's court. Miss, I'm not negotiating with you, but I'll, because of one of time. That's because I'm not, into the, I'm not in a position to negotiate. 
I'm not in a position to negotiate with you either, Minister, and I'll certainly stand by every question that I have asked this morning, including the questions to you, Minister. And I stand by every answer. Okay. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Um, Ms Davies, I just I looked at the um, 1920 annual report and the 2021 annual report, so I'm in the remuneration table. So in, in 2019, your base salary was $703,826. And in, the, in 2021, your salary was $766,659. So that's an increase. I'm just going on the figures in, the, in your annual reports. So, Senator, just, just for, for clarification, these well, how, are... Sorry, Ms Davies, how are, you how are you clarifying the annual report? I note there's no footnote at the bottom of the tables, but I'm so interested you, in your clarification of your please, salary. Please don't Well, if you let witness. me finish, I can give you that clarification, maybe, Senator. Um, if you if you look at the the annual report, which and year? I'll go back to the, which year? I'll go well, look at any year on the annual report, and the way that the remuneration and and you, I don't have a copy of what you have in front of me at this moment in time, but the way that that works, and I'll, I'll say it again, there is a, a base component of salary, and then there is an at risk component part of yes. that salary. And when you're looking at the REM reports or the annual reports, it is what, what has been paid. So when you, when you ask a question of, did your salary increase? Did the REM payment increase? Well, there was probably, you know, this year, if you look, there is a REM payment that has been, um, uh, an SDI payment that has been made that wasn't made last year. Yes, so, so, I, so I, Ms. I Davies, Ms. Davies, just to look at your, again, to look at your uh, base salary, so in the first column, and I'm sure that you will be able to avail yourself of your own annual reports. Your base salary in 2019 is $703,826. In 21, your base salary is $766,659. So that's an increase. That is an increase from 703 yeah, that, uh, to uh, 766. Absolutely. We're just trying to answer the question. Yeah, that is an increase. Absolutely. That is an well, increase. If I, can, if I can speak, Senator, absolutely. That was an increase from Thank you. 2019 to 2020. Thank yes, you. it was. Thank you. I don't know why that was so hard before. When I go to your total, well, pa total package in 2019, that was $1.264 million, so one million two hundred and sixty four thousand four hundred and sixty dollars and your whole your total pack total remuneration in twenty twenty one is one point five two five three two nine dollars million dollars so that's an increase as well yes that's an increase You're as well a question that is an increase as well it's, it's question mark it's an increase it's Senator, Senator, because because there was a bonus paid, there was an incentive paid uh, in the last financial year. So it is an increase because it wasn't paid the prior okay. year. That's so, so hang on a sec. So what is that you, Mr. Graham, speaking? It is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Senator. Okay. So, so because it wasn't paid last year, there's been an increase in the at-risk payment this year to make up for not getting it last year. No, that's not correct. That's well, that's what, it's, that's what it just it sounded like. Please don't over talk the witness. That's what no, it just sounded like. Please don't, please don't over talk the witness. It's disingenuous to explain it that way. As uh, Ms Davies had explained, there was no bonus paid the prior year to anybody in Australia Post. I wasn't talking about the bonus in the prior year. I said, gave you a 2019 total remuneration package and a 2021 total remuneration package. If you are bringing in the 2020 year as well, you are suggesting, Mr Graham, whether you mean to or not, you are suggesting, and the fact that it leapt to your mind is, oh, we didn't get any bonuses last year, so we'll make up for it this year. That's what it sounds like. Looks like way. Well, I think that's totally incorrect, uh, Senator. Then why did you uh, raise it? I, why did you raise it, Mr Graham? Because I was trying, because I was trying to explain the difference between uh, the numbers that you were discussing. And I gave you 2019 and 2021. 
and now you've brought in 2020 when, oh, poor you, you didn't get any bonuses. Senator, I think the, the tone is not appropriate. Um, uh, I think uh, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, order, Ms. order, chair, order. order. We need chair. to maintain the on a point order. Of, order. On we a point of order, so you must take my point of order. We, on a point of to... order, Mr. Graham can keep his comments about me to actually okay. to zero. I was going to say to a minimum, okay. but to zero. And if he wants to talk about tone, that is not his okay. place. Thank you, Senator. That actually is your place, Chair. Okay. And the fact that Mr Senator. Graham doesn't understand the standing orders Senator. of the Senate is actually, I know you're new, Mr Graham, but perhaps for estimates okay. next time, you can have a look at the standing orders. Thank or get someone okay. who is probably quite well remunerated to look at them okay. themselves Thank and you. inform you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. My, my we, apologies, sorry, Senator. order. Order. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Um, we should maintain the high standards that we expect. Um, I expect the witnesses to answer the questions that have been put by senators in a respectful way. And equally, um, I ask all senators not to overtalk witnesses. Um, so I invite you to Thank proceed you. with your um, line of questioning. Senator Kitching. I am going to come back to some more bonuses. But could I ask, um, could Australia Post confirm how many Australia Post employees are on the EBA? Senator, the one with Star Trek or the one with the Post? All, all up. 33,000 team members. Uh, we can get the exact number and take that notes, but 33,000 team members is the general figure. Could you ask someone, or if someone's paying, watching estimates from Australia Post and is able to get the exact figure, in uh, in a timely manner, as in sort of now, that would be very helpful. Um, yeah, we will do that, Senator. So, could I ask how many um, you've got? So you, it's thirty three thousand. Do you think it's slightly up from that? I'll get the, we're getting the exact number as we speak, Senator, but approximately 33,000, maybe you. upwards of 33 to 35. Sorry, 33 to 35, mm. something like that. Yeah, we, yeah, we'll get the exact number. Okay, thank you. I'll, I might come back to that as well. Now, could I ask you to refer to your 2021 annual report? So can you confirm for the record that Australia Post paid out $79 million in bonuses for the financial year ended 1 July 2021? That's correct, Senator. That is, that's correct. Um, can you confirm that over the course of COVID-19 from March 2020 until today, Australia Post has paid out $171.4 million in bonuses? I would ask Senator you Kitching, can I, uh, or Chair, Mr. Boys. apologies. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Rodney Boyce, Chief Financial Officer, Australia Post. Um, Senator Kitching, uh, thank you very much for that question. Australia Post, uh, over the two years, uh, pay, it pays uh, salary at risk uh, STI payments. Um, so across those years, um, a sales incentive scheme and also uh, bonuses, the thank you bonuses that we've referred to uh, several times. So, and uh, as per the annual report, um, and the provision set down in the annual report, um, there was, uh, I'll just turn to that page. Now, in the annual report, um, 92.4 million in FY20 and 79 million in, in FY21, and uh, the payments would have been approximately those same numbers. Yep. And I think we have responded to your question on notice for FY20 and, uh, and FY21 to that effect. Okay, thank you. Um, it's not quite two years though, is it? It's March 2020 until today, sort of a year and a half. Uh, I've quoted you the numbers as per the annual report uh, for the full year FY20 and the full year FY21. We did not, uh, we would have only paid a very small amount. Uh, I would need to check that in the period between March 20 and 30th of June 20. If you can come back to me, that would be very helpful, Mr Boyce. Mr Graham, do you have that exact figure yet? No, we're just chasing that figure up, Senator. Sorry, sorry, what was that, Mr Graham? We're, we're just chasing that figure up. It's just being compiled oh, okay. now. I'll get it for you as soon as Thank possible. You. 
Um, I'll go, I'll just, Chair, I think um, Senator Pratt might want to, just because she has an appointment. We, we can, you want to keep the witnesses, we can keep the witnesses here for... Yes. Oh, well, just... Do you, yes. Okay. Um, can I just get an indication of time, because we have some other agencies waiting, so what are, you, what are your thoughts on timing? I think we should be done bearing... A few more lines. Short please. 10, 15, 20, just... Maybe 15. OK. I would like, I would like before Australia Post finishes, f to have those figures. Oh, actually, okay. Mr. Well, Boys, we, well, Mr. Mr. Boys if, you, if you're able to get me that figure, but not in 30 days, if you can get it to me yeah. okay. as quickly as you can so today. So the request, request is to post that you provide the material uh, so that it can be uh, discussed in this hearing. Um, is that a reasonable... Is that something that you can do? Oh, well, I, I think That's that Mr Graham's going to be able to get me yeah, a I'm figure quite quickly. I'm just, I'm just checking. So, yeah. Senator yeah. Kitching and Chair, if, if I may just go back to the question from Senator Kitching, just so I'm aware of the exact uh, request. Um, if it's for payments made between 1 March or 31st of March and the 30th of June on, on bonus or or STI payments or incentive payments, um, then the amount will be uh, very, very small. It'll be for our sales incentive team. There will be no bonuses uh, and no uh, salary risk payments between that period. And are you going to give me a breakdown as per your table uh, where you've got bonuses and STIs? And, okay. Thank you, that would be... We, we, we've provided that already as a question on notice um, for FY for the full year FY20 yes. and uh, I believe yes, I, it's yes. either been provided or it's on its way for financial year 2021. And, and I think and, actually and you answered all of my quans within the time, so thank you. We have been working hard, Senator. OK. Yeah, thank no. you for <laughs> OK, OK. Thanks, Mr Senator. Boyce. I, should, I hope no, so. No, no. Order. <laughs> Order. One person at a time. So um, we're now going to go to a line of questioning from Senator Pratt. Mm -hmm. um, in the interim, Post can assemble the information and then we'll go back to Senator Kitching uh, and we'll aim to release you within 15, 20 minutes, okay? Senator Pratt. Are you aware, Mr Graham, uh, of who the alternate unaddressed mail providers in Australia are who can deliver unaddressed mail product at scale? Uh, I am not uh, aware in great detail, having been uh, in the role in uh, just over four weeks, but I will refer that to Gary Starr, who I know is uh, directly involved in that product uh, and service uh, for our customers. Do you have any knowledge about the IVE group? Again, I'll refer to, uh, to, to Gary to respond to that. Gary. I ap apologise, Senator, I was on mute. Gary Starr, Executive General Manager, Business Government and International. Um, yes, we do, um, uh, am aware of the IVE group. Yes, we do have a relationship with them and we do work with them. Okay, so they acquired Salmat in January 2020. They were previously the largest player that I know of in the unaddressed mail market. And they had customers like Woolworths and I think they remain customers of IVE. Are you aware that they're headed up by Executive Chairman and former New South Wales Liberal Party President Jeff Seelig? Um, I'm, 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 I'm aware of who the, the chair is, yes. According to the New South Wales Electoral Commission, Blue Star, one of the brands under the IVE umbrella, was a major printing client of the Liberal Party and worked during the 2019 election campaign. And Blue Star won more than $600,000 of work from the New South Wales Liberal Party, including posters, flyers, how to vote. I understand this is not core business for Australia Post, but I'll get to the point. They've been a member of the Liberal Party's federal forum for a number of years. The company acquired Salmat Marketing Solutions, who are the second largest provider of unaddressed mail other than Australia Post. The public register indicates I've donated some $55,500 to the federal Liberal Party in 2019. It's also reported that IVE Group received $18.3 million in contracts from the scandal-plagued ICANN, a contract that was not subject to competitive tender 
and Dominic Perrottet, then the New South Wales Treasurer, oversaw eye care at the time. So I'll get to the point, Mr Graham. What do you think would happen if Australian businesses and political organisations were forced to rely on the IVE group for delivery of unaddressed mail? Does that sound like a healthy thing for Australia's democracy? I can't comment on that, uh, Senator. Our role is to provide uh, services to our communities in which we operate, uh, to provide services to uh, a wide range of businesses, and we do so uh, on a commercial basis. OK, so you are nevertheless a government-owned organisation. If Australia Post were to exit or curtail your unaddressed mail service, where would that business go? I'm not aware where it would go. We have no intention of curtailing or cutting that service. Uh, it is an important service uh, to our customers uh, and we have uh, every intention to uh, remain in that business going forward. Okay. I'm very pleased to hear that with an election coming up. Have IVE Group approached you for any meetings since you became the CEO? No, they have not. Minister Hume, may I ask, has Minister Fletcher received any donations from the IVE Group since 2019? All donations would be on the register, Senator Pratt, but I will take the detail on notice. Thank you. Mr Graham, in the third quarter of 2020, several Australia Post executives worked up a plan to degrade the unaddressed mail service that Australia Post provided. I understand that these issues were discussed with board members, some of them at least, when senators questioned company executives about these discussions late last year. And there was no denial at the time. So now we, uh, instead we received a series of bizarre explanations about why Australia Post began examining the future of UMS. Have you been briefed about any internal deliberations regarding UMS? No, I have not. Uh, they've uh, came up in general discussions with our business around the range of products and services that we provide. And as I said, uh, you know, we have no intention uh, to reduce uh, those services. Uh, they are important services for a range of our customers. Like all com commercial uh, uh, outcomes, uh, we review uh, you know, our products on, a, on an ongoing basis in terms of their suitability, uh, as well as uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know, they are important uh, to our uh, community. So all our products are continually reviewed for, for suitability uh, and ensuring that we have uh, the ability to deliver to our customers' needs. Uh, but uh, UMS is no different uh, to those products. Okay, so is there or are you flagging now? You can assure us that there will be no changes to UMS before the next election? I can assure you that uh, there would be uh, no changes. We have currently none planned. Uh, as I said, uh, we continue to review all our products and services uh, on an ongoing basis, but at this point in time, no changes for UMS have been brought to my attention, and I therefore uh, can uh, say that before the next election, uh, it is highly unlikely that any changes will be made. Highly unlikely, but you can't rule it out. Will you I rule it out for us now as a service to Australian democracy? Well, we recognise the importance of UMS, particularly at the time of elections, and therefore uh, it would not be appropriate to make any changes to that before the next election, so I can rule it out. There was a push inside Australia Post by executives who were strong advocates for the alternative delivery day model without transparency to Parliament to degrade unaddressed mail such that businesses and political parties stopped using it, switched to other providers or switched to more expensive addressed mail products. I'm assuming given what you've said you won't tolerate any willful degradation of UMS. Well, as I said, and I'm happy to refer to Gary again, it is a product that, that we provide to a broad range of customers uh, and we recognise the importance uh, it has to those customers. Uh, we have various commercial arrangements in, in place uh, with those corporate customers uh, and we continue to review those arrangements as part of any normal commercial discussion. But I'll pass to Gary, who's got far more intimate detail in relation to uh, the, the product than I do. Gary? Thank you, Paul. Um, Senator, we do um, continue to provide unaddressed mail services both um, commercially and, 
and to, for government customers. And you know, we are currently delivering UMS as normal across the country. There are clearly at times delays with COVID, but we work to mitigate those. But we are committed to delivering for all our customers, including uh, you know the, the ten elections that we've had through the COVID period, both local state government elections um, where unaddressed mail is an important communication tool. So we've we've delivered 10, there have been 10 elections that we've supported across the country over since COVID commenced and um, yeah, we will continue to do so. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Hi, sure. it's, it's Kimberly Kitching. Did you have any um, complaints or any um, you know, where there was redress that you had to make for not delivering mail in council elections? Because my understanding is that there were some complaints from a variety of tickets in some of the Victorian local government elections. Because in um, fact, so for example, how to vote uh, mail, mail across different parties, um, the, you know, which is obviously an important piece of mail uh, in, a, in an election, were not delivered in time. In fact, they were delivered in some cases, two weeks after the close of the ballots. Uh, so we, there are, uh, from time to time, there are um, uh, issues raised um, and we work closely with um, MPs and the electoral commissions to address those issues. Sorry, not MPs, um, I'm talking about local government elections, so they would be councillors. Oh, for local government elections, I beg your pardon, Senator. So yes. Um, in, in all the cases that I mentioned, the, the, the last, the, the 10 election events, um, we work closely um, with the Electoral Commission and with councillors or, or MPs if, it's, if they're state elections. Um, and where issues are raised, we address them quickly and, and, and make sure that we do deliver. But there are, from time to time, um, there are issues with delivery um, and we work through those. Um, so are you able to just on notice give me um, sort of... Don't really an anonymised sort of list of complaints in, in for all ten election events. Um, I, I, I'd have to I'd have to check with um, I, I'd have to check what we can provide, Senator. Yeah, I'm, and I'm happy to. That, yeah, that's I, I just I'd, I, certainly the intent would be to give you the information that you're looking for. I just need to understand how we would draw that information out in yeah. an anonymised way and provide it. Yes, yeah, no, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, All right. Senator. Yes. No. Sorry, Chair. So, I'm just trying to get a sense of where we're up to Matt, now. So, um, sorry. sorry. I think Do you want to say to something? I, I know we've got to run out of time and I've got some other key things. So, I think yeah. someone... Hang on, hang on. Hang on. One of the... Sorry. I'm just trying to get... Um, maintain an orderly approach here. So, did one of the witnesses want to say something in addition to that? Chair. Chair. It's, well, it's Paul Yes, Graham. Mr Graham, yeah, I, was yeah. Just, I was just wanting to provide Senator Kitching with uh, the numbers that uh, oh, great, she would great. requested. OK. Thank so, you. Go ahead. If I, if I may, Senator Kitching, in terms of the total number of team members who are covered by EBA agreements, we have 32,541 in Australia Post, we have 3,366 in Star Trek, and we have 357 in a business that we have called Decipher. Called, sorry, called? Decipher, D-E-C-I-P-H-A. It's a payment business that, uh, that we own. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Graham. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So, Mr Graham, I just would want to be able to understand with relation to uh, UMS, you've said very clearly you won't tolerate any degradation or downgrading of those services. I've said that uh, we recognise the importance of those services to the communities and customers that we serve. Uh, those services, uh, like all our products, are, are uh, regularly reviewed to ensure that they are suitable uh, and consistent with the expectations that our customers have. Yes, but that is, you know, it's suitable that we have a regular delivery at an affordable price of unaddressed mail, particularly in the context of an upcoming election. You're not thinking of changing anything, you know, we've, you say you've had 10 elections, you can commit that nothing else is going to change, including the price between now and the next election? I would not expect that to be the case, correct. We have um, 
have you had any direct reports recommend that Australia Post increase prices for unaddressed mail? No, I have not. Great. Are you aware of what the consequences for regional Australia would be if Australia Post ever exited the UMS market? Well, as I say, Senator, I've had it brought to my attention uh, the uh, various products and services that we provide uh, and uh, the impact that they have uh, on communities. Uh, and uh, you know, we review those products and services to ensure that we are fulfilling both the obligations that we have and also that they are fit and appropriate uh, for our customers and the communities in which they operate. Okay. So, in relation to preparations for the upcoming of federal for the federal election, has Australia Post been complying with its regulated service standards for mail delivery frequency and mail delivery timeframes? I will uh, refer that question and the detail of that to uh, Rod Barnes, uh, who uh, is our head of network operations. Rod. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Senator. Rod Barnes, Executive uh, General Manager for Deliveries. Uh, very aware of our CS obligations, which we managed to achieve last year. Um, the situation at the moment with the relevant COVID challenges does make that particularly difficult, uh, and we are doing our best in some locations. So that surface is varying depending on the, on the traffic lane and the conditions we face. And we're operating under eight different state health orders and, uh, and requirements to comply. Uh, and we're doing our best to work that through. I can uh, send you in detail, Senator, I'll notice the specific performance by month across the products, if you like, and uh, that'll show it. We are looking towards improvement in recent events, not only in New South Wales, but with changes in Victoria. Uh, we are confident we're about to recover that service, Senator. Okay, and so in I the context ask, of... Can I just ask at this juncture, uh, to give an indication of additional lines of questioning? Uh, no, just I'm, just I'm this, gonna, and then we're done. I'm You're going on notice. Mr. Boys will be very pleased. I'm going to put some more questions on notice. Okay, so this is the last. Yeah, last line this of is the last line. Thank you, of Senator Pratt. Questioning. Please proceed. Uh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. It's not your fault. My apologies. <laughs> no, no. Um, in terms of uh, those standards, you've just given me an answer, but we understand there have been discussions in Auspost which included General Counsel that the company did not need to comply with regulations until the National <coughs> Audit Office undertakes an audit towards the back end of the financial year. Is that a view you share? No, Senator. We track okay. our performance every okay. day. So that's terrific to know that your reported performance um, in terms of pre preparation for the election uh, and problems with delivery times in terms of postal ballots uh, and postal vote applications uh, and that material getting from one end of the country and to remote communities and back again. Do you envisage any issues with um, people being able to have their vote counted? Senator, we'll be doing our very best as always. I think we've been, as Gary's explained, uh, quite successful with the elections we've already run and also the national census, which was a considerable volume of, of mail to manage and collections. Uh, and the recent election in WA, we were also trialled new services such as voting in post offices and getting to those communities, uh, I think worked very well. We will plan in those areas, clearly with the lack of passenger flights, which we expect to improve and changing uh, logistics in each region, we will plan closely and we do work closely with the Electoral Commission. I'm very com comfortable and very confident we'll provide a good service to the public for the election. Okay. Are, you, are you able to, um, do you do a report at the end of any election to kind of see whether there were any particular electoral impacts? Do you talk to the Electoral Commission about that? Yes, yes we do and we have regular reviews as we did with the census where we had a regular fortnight and six week catch up at a senior level. Are you able to table the review from the last election please, federal election? Um, to Gary's uh, previous question, the information we have um, around those performances for local council, we'll find that information we have. We also have feedback from those relevant uh, commissions as well that we could share, Senator. And I'd be interested in any, in any feedback from the WA election, noting the size of the state as well, please. Okay, certainly. Um, good. Just very quickly on miscommunication, does Australia Post draw, um, sorry, with respect to the unaddressed mail service, 
Any article that contains text which does not meet current community standards may be refused. Australia Post reserves the right to examine a sample of the article and you reserve the right to decline to offer the service if it believes appropriate to do so. Um, have you withheld any information and what link does Australia Post draw between community standards as outlined, which is your powers, and misinformation? Senator, may refer that uh, to uh, Mr McNamara uh, in relation to uh, what we do uh, in relation to that and also uh, to, uh, to, to Nick, uh, our legal counsel. It is a complicated uh, process and, and therefore we want to make sure we get it right. Dave? Uh, Paul, I'd probably give it to Nick because Nick is the, the best person in the, to, to right. answer that thank you. for the yeah. Senator. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. Uh, you've referred to provisions in our unaddressed mail service terms and conditions that deal with uh, Australia Post's discretion to uh, refuse to carry items uh, that don't meet uh, particular standards, and uh, you've referred to those, but they're set out in Clause okay. 3.5 of those terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Those uh, uh, That particular provision uh, is one that's called upon uh, quite rarely, uh, but on uh, the rare occasion that there are concerns regarding the content of an article that might be raised at an operational level, an article is uh, referred through to a cross-functional uh, group uh, at our support office in order to okay. uh, review the content relative to those terms and conditions and a number of assessment criteria. Uh, and so that's worked through in an objective way in order to form a view, and then that's communicated to the customer. OK, so, Mr Graham, can I ask? Um, the government has said they would have a crackdown on misinformation. Can you use these powers? Will you use these powers to prevent the distribution of misinformation? And what kinds of misinformation does Australia Post consider most egregious? Well, again, uh, Senator, I'd refer to, to Nick. Uh, it is a, a legal uh, question in many ways, and therefore I'd ask Nick to please respond. OK. And well, okay. in that context, yeah. given the government has said mis uh, they want to clamp down on misinformation, there's been rampant growth in it, have you uh, and will you as CEO take steps to ensure that you have a contemporary interpretation of what community standards are today? We will continue to review uh, the standards and review the clauses under which uh, we make those judgments. Uh, it is obviously a, a situation that uh, continually uh, is under review because of the changes that may take place in uh, you know, uh, societies, but uh, Nick uh, will sp provide specific detail as well with the process. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so safety, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want it on notice, or do you want to hear the answer? Uh, please, no. that would I would be I'd be happy to hear the answer very briefly. Okay. okay. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so, look, on the topic of misinformation, uh, perhaps it's worthwhile to go back to the terms and conditions, and what and what they talk about is it being a responsibility of the customer to ensure that they abide by relevant state and territory and Commonwealth laws. Uh, and, and those laws include, for example, uh, competition and consumer uh, regulations uh, around misleading and deceptive conduct. So thank you. I'd make that, that general yeah, observation. That's, that's uh, thank, you, thank, you, yeah. thank you, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Okay, thank Be you very much to all the officials from Australia Post. Uh, we remind you about the uh, due date for uh, questions uh, and we now invite you to disconnect and we'll move on to the Office of the E-Safety Commissioner by a video